Some of the same material that I give in many of my other talks, but I will also emphasize some of the things that I think transhumanists need to be thinking about in this area. Also, I will try my very best to remember to speak very slowly, because whenever I work with simultaneous translation, the translators always tell me that you can say something 30% more quickly in English than in any other language. So, um, I will do my best to speak slowly. This is the thing I am going to try to talk about. We have heard a little about it already, the irrational way that people think about aging. They think that it is immutable, that there is nothing we will ever be able to do about it, and they also think that it would probably be a bad thing if we didn't have it. The world would be different in all manner of bad ways. There would be too many people, or dictators would live forever, or things like that. But the important thing I want to emphasize here is the arrows. People don't really like to think seriously about whether aging really is immutable, because they have already decided that it's a good thing, so we wouldn't want to change it even if we could. And the same people also don't really have any interest in discussing whether aging is actually a good thing, because they've already decided that it's immutable. So who cares whether it's a good thing or not? We can't change it. So it's all a bit hopeless, really. And I spend a lot of my time trying to get people to address these two questions separately so that this problem is no longer present. How do we do that, though? Well, first of all, I think isms are scary. I was actually uh, the first recipient of an award from the World Transhumanist Association. It's called the H.G. Wells Award. James Hughes, who gave it to me, is in the audience. Um, it, was, it was for um, distinguished contributions to transhumanism or something like that. And I was rather embarrassed. I had to give this little acceptance speech, and I had to say that I didn't really think of myself as a transhumanist. I think it's useful to get away from ideologies and to emphasize that what we want to do, what people who call themselves transhumanists want to do, and what I want to do, is simply a natural continuation of what we are already doing and what we have already done in technology. In particular, when we look at the research that I do, that Sam's Research Foundation does, I like to emphasize that it is just medical research, just like any other medical research. The goal is to stop people from getting sick. And I will also talk later about this last point here. Uh, people tend to exaggerate what people like me are trying to do uh, in a way that makes it much scarier than it should be. <coughs> now, there are several definitions of transhumanism that people have given. But, in general, most people define it as a kind of ideology, a kind of <coughs> philosophy. I don't really define it that way myself. I think transhumanism is just a point of view, an opinion, like this. I think it is simply the view that greatly enhanced technology can, in the future, give us greatly enhanced human happiness. <coughs> And when you say it like that, you know, it's hard to argue with, really. 
the enhancement in technology that we have achieved over the past century or two centuries or more have certainly delivered greatly enhanced human happiness. So it seems natural that the same thing should be true in the future. But also, it's not a scary definition. It doesn't say anything like, we will become so different from today's humanity as today's humans are from Neanderthals, or anything like that. It doesn't say anything about the human condition, about what it means to be human. It's just really much more familiar, and I think that's really useful. So, now let's start talking about ageing. I like to start with this. It's something that we all know, but we don't think about it very much. The main problems, the main health problems that used to kill people 200 years ago are almost unknown in the industrialized world today. They are, of course, the major infectious diseases, like tuberculosis, for example. And the reason they have been almost eliminated is because that we could do it by simple methods, using just good hygiene. We heard about that earlier. Using vaccines and antibiotics and so on. We have made far less progress against the chronic diseases of old age. So it's important to ask ourselves the question, why have we made so little progress? The reason that most people would give is this. Don't worry, you don't have to translate this slide. You don't have to read this slide. The point is, there are a lot of things that go wrong with us during aging, and they all go wrong at more or less the same time and they interact with each other, they make each other worse. So it seems that the main reason why we can, why we have made so little progress is just because aging is really complicated. And that's an important reason, yes, but it's actually only the second most important reason. In order to explain the most important reason, I'm going to start with my definition of aging. Aging is the accumulation of damage. It happens as a side effect of the things that the body normally does, the things that the body has to do to keep us alive. Damage can be defined in this way. Damage is simply changes to the structure and composition of the body that the body does not automatically repair when they happen and therefore they accumulate. And the important thing here is that the body is naturally set up to tolerate a certain amount of damage, which is why until middle age nothing much goes wrong with the, way, with the function of the body, the performance of the body. But Eventually, there is too much damage, and the top performance of the body, both physical and mental, begins to decline. And that's when we get the chronic diseases and disabilities of old age. It's really simple. And, again, it makes it easy to understand and unscary, because this definition emphasizes that aging of the human body is really just the same as aging of a car or an aeroplane or any man-made machine. And of course we are very familiar with what that is, with the accumulation of rust, for example. And it makes it easy for us to understand that aging is not so mysterious as you might have thought. You can describe it in three words. Metabolism is the word that biologists use to, to encompass all of the things the body does to keep going from one day to the next. And as I have said, aging 
is the accumulation of damage throughout life, even starting before we are born, as a side effect of metabolism. Eventually, late in life, there is too much damage for the body to tolerate, and we get pathology. Now, here's the first problem that people have had in figuring out how to develop medicine for aging. <coughs> they have defined aging out here as somehow separate from disease. People mainly think of diseases as coming into these categories. There are infections, communicable diseases. There are congenital diseases that arise from mutations that we are born with, that a few people are born with. And then there are the chronic age-related diseases, which are progressive and mainly affect people late in life. And people think of aging as this set of things that are not diseases. These things that are bad for you, but they are somehow nebulous. You know, they are not really very specific. Sarcopenia means the decline in how much muscle you have during aging. Immunosenescence is the decline in performance of the immune system, and so on. This is the popular view of how, of how to classify the types of ill health that we experience. But this is how we should classify them. The columns are the same, but the big black line is in a different place. The important thing here is that column three is part of aging. The only difference between column three and column four is that the things in column three are the ones that we have given names to that we call diseases. <coughs> it's a semantic difference. It's just a difference of terminology. And, uh, and that's all. Now, once we, rem once we realize that, it becomes easier to see what we might do about aging. The first thing we can see is that this approach is completely hopeless. Geriatric medicine is the only thing we have today in the hospitals, in the clinic, to tackle the diseases and disabilities of old age. And indeed, almost all the research that is done to improve our medicine for those diseases is like this as well. We are, geriatric medicine, we are attacking the pathology. Effectively, what we are doing here is ignoring what I just told you, pretending that <coughs> the diseases of old age are just like infection, that they can be eliminated from the body. That's obviously not true for something that is a side effect of being alive. So, we are wasting our time trying to make this work better. It's better than nothing, but only a little bit better. Now, I am not the first person to realize this. Maybe a hundred years ago, people started to realize that this is never going to work. And that's where gerontology came from, the study of the biology of aging. People realized that we might be able to learn something by looking at the variation in the natural world in how rapidly organisms age. Different species age at very different rates. Even different individuals within the same species age at slightly different rates. Maybe if we could find out a lot about how that happens and why it happens, then we could use that knowledge to develop medicine to help people live longer than they normally would. Effectively, we would be trying to slow down the rate at which metabolism creates damage. And that's a pretty good idea, you might think. But actually, we have not succeeded in developing any medicine that works on this basis. Why not? Well, again, there is more than one reason. One reason is that most people are not really interested in medicine until they're already sick. 
They do not want to take medicine throughout their whole life in order to postpone the time at which they might get sick 50 years from now. And, of course, if you are only slowing down the creation of damage and you only start late in life, then you will not have so much effect in terms of delaying the time when the pathologies actually occur. But the second reason why the gerontology <coughs> approach has been unsuccessful is rather similar to one of the problems with the geriatric approach. Here it is. Metabolism is very complicated. Th this is a simplified diagram <laughs> of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works. And you can see that it's almost inconceivable that we could ever find ways to tweak it so that it did not do the thing that we don't want it to do, the creation of damage, without also having unintentional consequences so that it stops doing some things that we do need it to do. It's hopeless. In fact, it's even more hopeless than that, because this is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how the body works. And any biologist will tell you that there's a huge amount more that we don't know about how the body works, even ignoring all the stuff that we don't even know that we don't know. You know, <coughs> but, about 30 years ago, something changed. And it's something that was probably not as important as many people think it is, but I should mention it because it's, it gets a lot of attention. About 30 years ago, people started to discover mutations in certain organisms in the laboratory, which did exactly this. They slowed down the rate of accumulation of damage, sometimes quite a lot, and extended the healthy lifespan of the animals in question. Actually, this should not have been such a surprise as it was, because really, it was just the same phenomenon that had been discovered in a different way 50 years earlier in the 1930s. That phenomenon is that you can get animals to live longer by starving them, by feeding them less than they would like. And it turns out that the mutations that have the same effect do so by activating the same genetic pathways, more or less by essentially tricking the animal into thinking that it doesn't have enough food. But, this turns out not to be very promising for medical purposes either. The main reason it's not promising is that this whole idea of living longer when you starve seems to work much less well for long-lived species than it does for short-lived species. So we might be able to get one or two years of extra life in this kind of way. We might not even get that much. But we certainly won't get 10 years, let alone 30. I'm sure of that. In fact, Laurent Alexandre earlier today talked about this. He said that it is implausible that we will find simple methods to achieve large amounts of life extension. And I agree. This is basically what I just said. We will not be removing the damage that has already happened before we started the therapy. But also, longer lived species do not have such strong life extension pathways in them that can be activated in these simple ways. So, we need another approach. And this is the approach that I think will work. 
The maintenance approach is very similar, coming back again to simple ways to describe things to non-specialists. The maintenance approach is basically what we already do for simple man-made machines, to let them work and perform for much longer than they were initially built to work. Instead of trying to slow down the rate at which damage is created, or to slow down the rate at which damage creates pathologies, instead we separate those two processes from each other by going in and periodically repairing some of the damage so that even though it is still being created, it does not reach the level that causes sickness. Here's a car. This car is 100 years old, and it was probably built only to last 10 or 15 years. The reason it has lasted so much longer is simply preventative maintenance. People have they have been very careful and they have removed the rust before the doors fell off and so on. Now, you have seen this slide once before. I am going to concentrate now on this bottom, on this last point. When people talk about my work and about the work of other people who are interested in medicine for aging, they often use words like immortality, and they shouldn't. I don't work on immortality. I don't even work on longevity. All I do is I work on health. I am interested in stopping people from getting sick, just the same as any other medical researcher. And yes, there will be a side effect. If we succeed, when we succeed in developing medicines that keep people healthier for a longer time, then on average, those people will live longer. Now again, that is exactly the same as any other medicine. Medicines that we have today have the side effect that the people that get them live longer than they would if they didn't get them. It's not scary, it's simple. And it's really important for me to correct people when they make mistakes like that. Journalists, I know there are a lot of journalists in the audience. Hands up any journalist who was thinking of writing an article about this talk with the word immortality in the title. Um, right. Um, yeah, I should have asked before. Uh, uh, all right. However, uh, I don't want to be too strong here because, of course, I think that the longevity benefit of this work could be quite a lot bigger than the longevity benefit of medicine that we have today. But still, we should be careful. As Laurent Alexandre said earlier today, the the phenomenon of aging is extremely complex and it is really very hard to imagine that we could completely defeat it. In some ways, I am actually even more pessimistic than Laurent because I think that cancer is probably even harder to defeat than he thinks it is. I think that personalized genetics for cancer may very well be a powerful tool, but I do not think that we will defeat cancer completely using that kind of approach. In general, I think that, to summarize, the therapies that Sense Research Foundation is working on and that I have written about and spoken about for the past 10 or 15 years will probably give us about 30 years of extra life when they are developed. And, incidentally, I still think that we have a good chance of developing these therapies within the next 20 years or so, just so long as the 
the financial support for this work is sufficient. But the reason why people get very excited about the longevity consequences of this approach is because it is a rejuvenation approach. We have heard already this afternoon about the prospects for rejuvenation. What that means is that we can apply it to people who are already in middle age, or maybe even older, and turn back their clock, restore them to the same physical and mental performance of a young adult, of someone in their 20s or 30s. That means that it will be another maybe 30 or 40 years before those people become biologically middle-aged again. They may be 100 before that time. And that's a long time in which to develop improved therapy let's say, sense 2.0. So, if we have someone who is, let's say, 60, and they are rejuvenated with sense 1.0, and they are not biologically 60 again until they are 100, then they get sense 2.0, even though sense 1.0 might not be able to might only be able to give them 10 more years of life, Sense 2.0 might be able to give them 50 more. So in other words, we may be able to stay one step ahead of the problem indefinitely. That is a phenomenon that I have called longevity escape velocity. And it turns out, if you think about these numbers a little bit, that if we can indeed get 30 years of extra life from sense 1.0, we will almost certainly have reached longevity escape velocity already by then. And we will find it increasingly easy to stay above longevity escape velocity, to continue to improve these therapies fast enough to keep people youthful however long they live. Now, here at the bottom is the irritating thing. I believe that we have maybe a 50% chance of developing Sense 1.0 within the next 20 years. But that is an extremely speculative and subjective estimate. I think there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get there for 100 years if we just hit a bunch of new problems that we haven't thought of yet. You know, maybe that doesn't matter because, after all, a 50% chance is quite enough to be worth fighting for. But still, I wanted to emphasize how speculative this estimate is. By contrast, I am absolutely certain of this, that once we get to sense, point, sense 1.0, we will have done the hard part, and it will be plain sailing from then on. It is almost inconceivable that we will fall back below longevity escape velocity after that. But, if you ask what have people's reactions been to all of this, you would not know what I just told you. The reaction to the whole idea of Sense 1.0, which I am going to be talking about in a little more detail shortly, has been, well, maybe it'll work, it sounds pretty hard, maybe it'll take 40 years, but it seems biologically plausible. But many people's reaction to the concept of longevity escape velocity has been absolute incandescence. People think I'm completely insane. They, they, they just don't want anything to do with it. It's extremely sad because it's completely illogical. All right.
I'm going to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes talking about what Sense 1.0 actually is, what the technologies are that we want to develop, and what we expect them to achieve. The starting point is to explain what damage is. I have defined damage so far simply as the set of all the side effects of metabolism that accumulate in the body and eventually contribute to the ill health of old age. Now, the reason why the maintenance approach is feasible is summed up on this slide. It starts with the left column. It seems that we can classify all of the types of damage that happen in the body into this very manageable number of categories, just seven categories. You can see that these categories are very broad, but they have two things going for them. They have two features. Firstly, they are very well defined. Cell loss, for example, it's a very easy thing to define. It is simply cell death that is not compensated by the division of other cells. Very simple. The second reason, and the most important reason why this classification is so useful, is because of the list on the right. For each category, we can also describe a generic therapy, a generic approach to fixing any, any example within the category. And when I say it is generic, I mean that for different examples within a category, we may need to do slightly different things, but only slightly different. So, for example, cell loss, the way we the generic fix is stem cell therapy. You have all heard of stem cell therapy. That's what it is. We put cells into the body that are set up in a way so that they know to divide and differentiate to, to replace the cells that the body was not replacing on its own. And different stem cell therapies for different organs are definitely different. That's why stem cell research is such a big field. But the reason why stem cell research is a field at all is because different stem cell therapies also have many things in common. It's the same story for all the rest of these. And because I know that most of you are not biologists, and also because I do not have very long, I will not go through all of these. But I will talk a little bit about some of them that we are working on at Sense Foundation. First of all, though, I'm going to emphasize a little bit about the relationship between damage and pathology. I have said that the ill health of old age is caused by the accumulation of damage to a level that it is impossible for the body to tolerate. But it is important to describe this in more detail so, again, that you see that this is not a mystery, that this is simply familiar and well-known fact. In some cases, it's really easy to make that, to do that explanation. Cancer, for example, really it is synonymous with one of the seven types of damage. When I say here division of cells, I simply mean cells which are in a state where they divide when they are not supposed to. That is pretty much the definition of cancer. But in many cases, the situation looks more complicated. There are many things which can go wrong with the heart during old age, and it turns out that they are caused by different types of damage. The number one cause of death in the Western world is atherosclerosis, the disease of accumulating fatty, fatty deposits in the major arteries which eventually burst and cause heart attacks and strokes. 
And that is caused by this one here in purple, intracellular junk. Molecular waste products that accumulate inside cells. In this case, it is white blood cells that are in the walls of the major arteries. Then there is arteriosclerosis. That's a, it sounds similar, but it's a completely different thing from atherosclerosis. It is the hardening of the artery so that they are less elastic than they were. And it is the reason, the main reason, why we have high blood pressure when we get old. You all know that high blood pressure is bad for you. It causes kidney failure and so on. It is basically caused by this pink one down at the bottom. There is a lot of sugar in the bloodstream, and that sugar occasionally reacts chemically with the proteins that give our arteries their elasticity. And sometimes those reactions make changes that reduce the elasticity, so that the artery becomes stiffer and the blood pressure rises. Then there is amyloidosis. It turns out that people who get to the age of 105 or 110 very often die of heart failure caused by the accumulation of waste products in the spaces between cells, not inside cells at all. And in this case, the type of waste product is something called amyloid, <coughs> made from a protein that normally transports hormones around the body. And this amyloid needs to be eliminated because it is very dangerous, especially if you get to be over 105. And then finally, there's also cell loss. The reason the heart beats is because there are cells in the heart called pacemaker cells, which are told by the brain that the heart should beat. They are effectively the messenger that transmits signals from the brain. And it turns out that the number of those cells goes down during life because they die and they are not replaced. So, eventually, there are not enough of those cells and the heart can stop even if everything else about the heart is perfectly normal and functioning. Now, it looks pretty complicated now. One, one organ, lots of different types of damage, lots of different diseases. But the important thing is that everything I've told you here is well known. None of this is my idea, none of it is even controversial. Any people who study these diseases will tell you what I have just told you. That's really important to remember because it means that this approach is not nearly so controversial or radical as some people might think. It's the same in the brain. Many of you may be thinking, well, maybe this kind of approach can restore physical performance and maybe maintain it indefinitely. But there's not much point in having good physical performance if you don't have good mental performance. So we must absolutely rejuvenate the brain as well. But luckily, the brain is made of basically the same stuff as the rest of the body. And sure enough, the brain accumulates the same types of damage. Different examples within the categories, but still within the same seven categories. Alzheimer's disease has all these three things. In fact, it was defined as having these two when Dr. Alzheimer first identified it more than 100 years ago. Again, this is not controversial. This is well established. I want to come back to that slide from early on where I said that the difference between aging and age-related diseases is just a semantic difference. Here is, again, a reinforcement of that the non-specific nebulous things that I had in column four on that original table are also all caused by the same thing. We can look at the accumulation of fat, for example, which is essentially because fat cells are not dying when they're supposed to. Things like that. Um, I'm going now to talk for a few minutes about some of the research that we are doing at Sense Research Foundation. 
so as to give you a sense that this is not just theory, and it's not so hard as all that. Progress is quite rapid, and I hope that when you see how well we are doing, you will agree with me that it's reasonable to predict that we will finish this job in 20 or 30 years. So, I told you already a little about atherosclerosis. It is caused by the accumulation of fat in the artery wall, and that begins inside white blood cells. Here is one of those white blood cells. It has been poisoned by some material that it tried to process. This material is an oxidized variant of cholesterol. And because it has been poisoned, the white blood cell no longer works. It is full of fatty deposits like this. People give it a different name, in fact. They call it a foam cell. And that's the beginning of atherosclerosis. Now, as I said, it is it gets this way because of a toxic molecule. There are actually several different molecules that are toxic, but there is just one which seems to be the most important. It's the most abundant and the most toxic. It's called 7-ketocholesterol, 7-KC. And we have found a way to get rid of it. We have identified bacteria that are able to break down 7-KC. And then, that was several years ago, maybe six years ago, we found these bacteria. About four years ago, we figured out how they were doing it. We found the genes and enzymes that they used to break it down. And then was the really difficult part. We had to try to get those genes working in human cells. Human cells and bacterial cells are very different, so we had to make some important changes. But eventually we got it to work, and this is a kind of illustration of that. This was published a couple of years ago now. What this shows is that if you give these cells a huge amount of this toxic molecule, they all die. No surprise. But if you give them less concentrations, lower concentrations of the same stuff, then they live a lot longer. And in particular, they are protected as compared to cells that did not have our special gene from bacteria. <coughs> These other bars here, the, the shorter bars, are what scientists call negative control. For example, they are cells that don't have the enzyme, or they have the wrong enzyme, or they have the right enzyme, but it's not being sent to the correct part of the cell. So, this is really good news, and of course we are progressing as fast as we can to get this working in mice, and then of course we will try to make it work in humans. But it show, it's a classic example of the maintenance approach. We are here identifying a way to remove damage that has accumulated throughout life as a result of the inability of the body to repair that damage when it is created as a side effect of the body's normal operation. So we would expect that if we can do, for example, a bone marrow transplant using cells that have been engineered to make this enzyme, then some of the patient's white blood cells will be able to break down the material that is creating atherosclerotic flux and eventually the plaques will start to shrink and go away. And the person will have no risk at all of ever dying of a heart attack or a stroke. That's what we want to achieve across the whole of this panel of therapies. Here's another example, which is to do with amyloidosis. Remember I told you about this disease that kills a lot of people who are over the age of 105. We have found antibodies that can stimulate the immune system to protect against this amyloid substance. Either they are just protective, which is shown here, or there is another approach, which I will show you on the next slide. Here what we are seeing is simply that cells which normally live this long, 
uh, are able to have this amount of viability live only half as long or half as well if you give them this toxic amyloid substance. But if you also give them the antibody, they live just as well as if you didn't give them the amyloid at all. So that's a very good sign. It shows that this antibody is protective. This, however, is perhaps even more dramatic. And this was published just a few months ago. Um, here what we are doing is not just uh, binding the toxic molecule and keeping it away from the cells that it would otherwise poison. We are actually chopping up the toxic molecule, breaking it down. Because these antibodies are special types of antibodies, they're sometimes called catabodies, and they actually break proteins apart. In particular here, we have to be very careful what type of protein we break. Because, like all amyloids, the amyloid that poisons very old people's hearts is made of a protein that normally does an important job in the body. It turns out that the difference between good amyloid, the good version of this protein and the bad version, is in the shape that it has. When it's in the correct shape, four copies of it group together to make what's called a tetramer. And we want our antibody not to touch the tetramer. We want it to leave it alone. But we want the antibody to break down the form that is in the monomeric state, the form that is in a different shape which does not form the tetramer. And sure enough, our antibody breaks it down very successfully, very easily. So this is, again, a very early stage, but still a very promising indication that we may be able to get rid of this gradually accumulating substance that is eventually poisonous to the hearts of old people. <coughs> All right, well, so this is my conclusion. We need to try to stop scaring people, and it's actually quite easy. Everything that I'm telling you today is true of other radical technological ventures too, like artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Really, it is simply the quest to create greater automation. That's all it is. For the past 200 years, we have been creating and increasing automation, and the cleverer our computers get, the more we will automate the, the jobs that we have to do that we wish we didn't have to do. So that shouldn't scare anybody. And it's the same for ages. Medical research is respected by everybody, and this is just medical research. When people talk about changes to what it will be to be human and so on, well, you know, that just happens. I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a counterproductive topic for conversation. We should try to get people off this subject. We should not really take pride in trying to be so radical. And the reason we shouldn't is because we don't need everybody else to be radical. We don't need everybody to be visionary. We just need them to be on our side. We really do need that. We need widespread support if we are to succeed rapidly in important technical or technological ventures that are expensive. The fact is, medical research is expensive. I estimate that if we had much more money, we could be going at least three times faster in this research we would definitely bring forward the defeat of aging by several years if we started getting funded now at a proper rate. So, you know, that's a lot of lives that are being wasted right now, that are being lost, simply because people don't understand that this is just medicine. If you want to know a lot more about the work that we do, I suggest you read my book, which is quite detailed, in fact it's very detailed, but it is not full of jargon, it is written for non-biologists, so um, if you are persistent you should be able to read it, 
Of course, you must also remember we have a website where we publish details of our research and <coughs> article research all the time and other newsworthy items. So I will stop there and I think I was time for some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question uh, about um, uh, your drawing when you are speaking about uh, energy and pathology. You are speaking of uh, genetics and gerontology. Um, so you said that uh, to starve, uh, the starving is not a way to reduce the energy, to reduce. Um, uh, to enhance the life expectancy, uh, but to take, uh, to use the metaphor of car, uh, what is the place of uh, knowing how to use the car? Because um, if you use the car the right fuel and uh, take care of it, it lasts longer. And uh, for the body, I mean, it's the same. But here, you are not speaking about it. I think that's a, okay. It, it's a good question. So. I think that using a car really badly, you know, putting the wrong type of petrol in it or something, uh, that's equivalent to using the body really badly, like getting seriously overweight or smoking a lot, for example. And everybody knows, I, am certainly, I certainly agree that we can shorten our lives a lot by using the body really badly. But What's important to remember is the difference between being, being averagely well-behaved with your body and being really, really well-behaved. What I'm really trying to say here is that that difference is very small. If we, if we consider average as the kind of baseline, we can make it a lot shorter, but we can only make it a little bit longer. And it's the same with a car. If you treat your car as well as most people do, it will last as long as the manufacturer expected it to, maybe 10 or 15 years. But even if you treat it really well, it won't last all that much longer unless you do preventative maintenance. And when I say that, I mean more preventative maintenance than the law tells you to. More preventative maintenance than most people do. So it's, uh, you think that just uh, to treat the body um, with uh, care, you could uh, just expand the life expectancy for very short exactly. and the quality of life for a uh, very small part? Maybe there will be greater impact on quality of life. Some data from mice and rats uh, would suggest that. But it's hard to know. We just don't know. But yes, maybe there would be more effect on quality of life. Uh, I mean, the reason I want to emphasize this, of course, is that If people are over-optimistic about how much extra life they will get from simple measures, whether it's lifestyle or simple drugs, for example, then they will be correspondingly less interested in focusing on more difficult approaches like this. They will say, oh, well, why bother? You know, we can get 20 or 50 years of life just by, using, just by supplements or whatever. They have to understand that that's not true, and that's what will concentrate their minds on the approach that really will work. I would like to look back at the first session regarding transhumanism, when we heard about left anonym and the Zoltan Piston's new party, because it's a long problematic issue for the transhumanist movement to face up that we have relays, active researchers, we have policy specialists, we have activists like biohackers, neurohackers, but we seldom have the feedback between them. And I think it's important to promote the discussion because the risk otherwise we don't offer through the activists and the policy side hope for a general population or a part of the population that is susceptible to transhumanist ideas to support them, then we will get this thing going, actually. I think you're right. I mean, I wasn't here this morning, so I don't know what was said, but yes, 
I'm not really saying that uh, anything that hasn't been said before here, but I think the problem I'm trying to highlight here is getting more serious as the technologies make more progress. We are, we are, we are in a state today, I think, in the longevity research and in other areas that are normally called transhumanist, in which the activism, the attempt to change people's minds and to change policy is being harmed by, yes, by the <coughs> lack of debate between different people, but in particular when the debate does happen, by the debate being unnecessarily ideological. I think that if the debate is made overwhelmingly technical, and we just talk really about, in down-to-earth terms about the actual things that could be done soon and what they might achieve. And we <coughs> emphasize that this is just the same type of progress that we have been making in the past, whether in medicine or in automation and so on, then it will be much easier to sell it to the public and also to policymakers. I think it will be more difficult actually in some respects because you have other ideologies that are discussing the same topics and giving different answers to these questions and they're forwarding them quite forcibly into policy areas and using activists. How so, but why are they being effective? Why are they succeeding? Because sometimes because they have a good knowledge of science but also that they are able to <coughs> Good policy work. Well, I, I don't know. I, th I, I mean, this I, is a long question that has afflicted both libertarians and socialists of all types. So it's not a new question for transhumanists. Sure. Some, some parts we can learn from but, other. But other the point is, someone who is against radical technologies will find it much harder to persuade people that we are evil if they have to persuade people that if, 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 if what they're up against is people who are just doing medical research. You know, if it's just medical research, it's hard to argue Because again. it's not, not good medical research. It's not focusing on the imminent problems. That's one way of tackling it. Possibly. Um, I, it's a small question. I just want to know in the research you mentioned, uh, which one are from your uh, research centers? And, uh, and uh, did you mention other research from other places? So, the two projects that I mentioned just now are both done in university labs but funded by Sense Research Foundation. We are quite small, we have a budget of about $5 million each year, and about one third of that is used on research that happens at our headquarters in California. The rest of it happens in research in university labs around the world, mostly in the USA. Um, so we have a, we have three big projects at our headquarters and about twelve other projects elsewhere. So how do you interact with other places to Yeah. Yeah. All, the, all the usual ways, you know, we go to conferences, we, um, uh, we publish, the usual, the usual ways. Okay, we have time for the last question. Yeah, that's, that's not really a question and it will come in the debate also, but this question of using or not the I word and using or, or not uh, life without limits and so on. Uh, okay. Sometimes it's good to use it. For me, sometimes it's good not to use it. But actually, you say, oh, my goal is not uh, living forever. But after that, you show the title of your book, and it's Ending Aging. So, uh, And uh, one of the dangers of, of the way you are acting the last years, let's say, is also that uh, people could say, oh, but they are hiding. They don't want to let you know what's the final goal. And we know that the final goal is still to stop diseases related to old age, if possible, and to slow them down as much as possible. And so, of course, there are many consequences. And one of the consequences is 
some kind of uh, well, bio what what uh, specialists call biological immortality, life without diseases, and we, you know, and we know, and okay, people against us, against these ideas, always know, or also know that if you don't die die of old age, you sh you would live in average thousand years because the mortality for one person of uh, twenty is now something like 0.1%. Uh, so I, I think there is no solution, but when the mainstream is more going to life extension, what the, the, I think it's the, the case the last years, it's better to be a little bit more radical and not a little bit less. But well, well, yeah, I mean, I, of course I understand that point of view, but I feel that the way to be most effective is to prevent our opponents from using straw man arguments against us. In other words, arguments that are based on a misrepresentation of what we are saying. So, this has happened since the dawn of time, since the myth of Tithonus. You know, people have said, oh well, immortality is a bad idea because we will be sick for all that time. So, describing everything in terms of health right from the beginning and repeating it all the time is the only way to stop people doing that. And then when we talk about um, uh, the eventual goal of indefinite longevity, if we talk about it in terms of ageism, it is my plea here, we can say simply, is there any age at which medicine is inappropriate? Yeah. <laughs> Should we not say that old people are people too, and the, if, oh, uh, however long ago you were born, you still have a human right to be healthy. That's really all one needs to say, and it's quite hard for any conservative or any opponent of ours to argue against it. So that's what I'm, all I'm trying to do, really, to eliminate easy options for our opponents. Okay. Uh, thank you.